Nowhere, wallahi, I say nowhere in the world is there a greater disgrace for the two billion Muslims than Jerusalem. Nowhere in the world, surrounded by Muslims, a place bigger as Wales. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, Mawlana Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man sabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiteen wa ba'd. Respected brothers, elders, sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, hopefully today we will finish off covering Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu's conquest of Jerusalem. Now, if you recall, in the last session, I, we reached approximately where Umar radiyallahu anhu reached Jabiya. And then he met the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. And then it was time to go and meet the patriarch. The patriarch said that he would only give the key to Umar radiyallahu anhu and he would give it to nobody besides Umar radiyallahu anhu. So now Umar radiyallahu anhu decides to leave for Jabiya, sorry, for Al-Aqsa. Now Umar was Umar, he had traveled all the way from Medina wearing these clothes which had 17 patches on. So it's time to meet the patriarch. So the other Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, O Amir al muminin you've come from so far, all the way from Medina, and these people, they have a pomp and lavish lifestyle. What we don't want to happen is that all your travel has been wasted because they see you and they say, this is not a leader. So they say, Umir al-Mu'mineen, why don't you just for the meeting change your clothes and then after the meeting you can go back to your old clothes. So the narration, in some narrations, it's mentioned that Umar radiallahu anhu now went into the tent. He took off his old clothes with 17 patches. And now he wore these new clothes. And now he's going to, so he comes out of the tent. He takes a few steps. And he turns to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. And he said, remember, kunna qawman adillah fa'azzan Allah bil Islam. He said, do you remember that there was a time that we were a base nation? That we were nobodies? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored us through Islam. Where will we be if we teach the, if we leave the teachings of Islam? The narration mentioned that Umar radiallahu anhu went back into the tent. He took off his clothes, new clothes and wore his clothes which had 17 patches and then he went to meet the patriarch wallahi this is amazing history remembers that man who had 17 patches on his clothes and history has forgotten those who wore pomp and lavish clothes because history remembers those people who are people of khair and good 1400 years later we sit in Birmingham today and we remember a man who had 17 patches on his clothes. Imagine if you met a person outside who had 17 patches on his clothes, how you and I would view that person. But this was Amir al-Mu'mineen radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu now, he leaves Jabiya and he's going now with his khadim and they reach the outskirts of Jerusalem and everybody is waiting to see this man, Amir al-Mu'min, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the most powerful man on the face of this earth. So Umar radiallahu anhu is now with his khadim and uh, if you remember rightly, I, I, remember, I mentioned that they had two mounts. One was a nicer mount and one was not that nicer mount that they took with them. Just two people travel all the way from Medina, all the way to Jerusalem. So when they reach near Jerusalem, it's the turn of the Khadim to ride the nice mount. 
So Umar radiallahu anhu says, you ride this mountain. And he said, Amir oh, al look, there's thousands of people out there waiting to meet you. They want to see you. They're not waiting for me. People will say, you the Khadim are riding the nice mount and the most powerful man on the face of this earth. Amir al Umar ibn Khattab is riding not a nice, such a nice mount. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, Adawr dawruk. He said, the turn is your turn. And then he said, honor is given to those who fulfill their promises. So imagine, look, Umar radiallahu anhu, the most powerful man on the face of this earth. Thousands of people are waiting for him at the gates of Jerusalem. And Umar radiallahu anhu goes, goes with the mount, which is an inferior mount. But the truth is that Umar remained Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Khadim remained the Khadim. It didn't make an iota difference. Why? Because see, Allah is the one who gives Izzah. Allah is the one who gives honor and Allah is the one who takes away honor. So then Umar radiallahu anhu, he reaches the walls of Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is very interesting. Why? Because Jerusalem is very similar to how it was in the early times. Until today, you have the Babi Umar. Where Umar radiallahu anhu entered Jerusalem, you still have that door. It's still there. It's known as the Babi Umar. So the patriarch is now waiting for Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. And then him and Umar radiallahu anhu, they have an agreement. They create a pact. And I'm going to read the pact for you. It's a very famous pact. It's one of the unique pacts because in that time, religious freedom did not really exist. The conquerors conquered and they did exactly what they wished. And those who were conquered were subdued and they really had no rights. So Umar radiallahu anhu now he sits with the patriarch and they agree on this pact. So I will read the pact to you. Umar radiallahu anhu starts it. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. This is the assurance of safety which the servant of God, Omar, the commander of the faithful, has given to the people of Jerusalem. He has given them an assurance of safety for themselves, for their property, their churches, their crosses, the sick and the healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. Their churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be destroyed. Neither they nor the land on which they stand, nor their crosses, nor their property will be damaged. They will not be forcibly converted. No Jew will live with them in Jerusalem. Here's a clause that they will not be forcefully converted, nor will live with them in Jerusalem any Jew. Now, this was a condition which was placed by the Christians before they drew a pact with Umar ibn Khattab anhu. Actually, before Umar anhu became the Amir, no Jew was actually even allowed into Jerusalem. So the Christian said, well, we will sign this pact and we will give you the key on one condition that you do not allow the Jews to live in Jerusalem. What Umar radiallahu anhu did is that he allowed the Jews to come and visit. Where before the advent of Islam, before the Muslims conquered, they were not even allowed to visit Jerusalem. So Umar radiallahu anhu said this. And then the treaty carries on. The people of Jerusalem must pay the tax taxes like the people of other cities and must expel the Byzantines and robbers. Byzantines were those Romans who ruled, but the Christians could stay. Those of the people of Jerusalem who want to leave with the Byzantines, take their property and abandon their churches and crosses will be safe until they reach the places of refuge. So if anybody wanted to leave, you're free to leave. The villagers may remain in the city if they wish, but must pay taxes like the citizens. Those who wish may go with the Byzantines and those who wish may return to their families. Nothing is to be taken from them before the harvest is reaped. 
And then Umar radiallahu finishes the pact off. He said, if they pay their taxes according to their obligations, then the condition laid out in this letter are under the covenant of God. Meaning we would regard it, we will fulfill it. And the responsibility of his prophet, of the khalifs and of the faithful. So this is the first covenant, the first pact. Really, this was very unique. Why was it very unique? Because until then, when you conquered a place, you did whatever you wanted. But Umar actually gave them entire freedoms that they could keep their churches, that they could worship exactly how, how they wished, as long as they paid their taxes. This was signed by Khalid bin Walid, Amr ibn As, and Muawiyah and Abdurrahman ibn Awf. They finished signing the pact. The patriarch now gives the key to Umar radiallahu anhu. And then the patriarch begins to cry. So Umar radiallahu anhu says to the patriarch, what are you crying for? He said, this is how it works. Some, some days the upper hand is for you, some days the upper hand is for us. So the patriarch says, that's not why I'm crying. I'm crying because as long as the Muslims have a leader like you, they will never be defeated. He said, I know one day we win, one day you win. But as long as the Muslims have a leader like you, they will never be defeated. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, he enters Al-Aqsa. You remember the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And if you cannot pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa, then at least send oil to be burnt in the lanterns of Masjid Al-Aqsa. At that time, Masjid Al-Aqsa was not even in the hands of the Muslims. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa. The first man in the history of Islam to pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa was Umar ibn Khattab. No man before him. He was the man who fulfilled the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. In the first rakat, he prayed Surah Al-Sad. And did the sajda of Dawud because Dawud was in that vicinity. In the second rakat, Umar anhu recited Surah Al Isra, where the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about taking the Prophet وسلم, from the Haram to Masjid Al Aqsa. Subhanallah. My brothers, sisters, remember this. We are in and we have an opportunity where we live we have an opportunity that is very easy for us to go and fulfill the prophecy of the message of allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to travel to masjid al-aqsa two three hundred pounds that's all it costs you go there four hour flight ease go and pray two rakats in masjid al-aqsa and if you cannot pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa, the Prophet Sallallahu said, then send oil to be burnt in the lantern. You know what the ulama say? What does it mean? Send oil to be burnt in the lantern. They say that it means that you do something to help Masjid Al-Aqsa. Look at SubhanAllah. You do something to help Masjid Al-Aqsa. Masjid Al-Aqsa is the third holiest place for the believers. Those who are living around Masjid Al-Aqsa today are fulfilling the Fardul Kafaya on behalf of the Muslims. You hear sometimes brothers saying, oh no, I don't really want to go to Masjid Al-Aqsa. You know, it's too much problems there. Subhanallah. You want other people to protect your third most holiest site. And you don't want to go on a four hour flight. You don't want to spend four hours at the airport. La ilaha illallah. Umar ibn Khattab. The only place in his ten and a half years as the Khalif, the only place that Umar ever traveled outside Medina was to collect the keys of Masjid Al-Aqsa. Unless it was for Hajj. Nowhere else. So Umar anhu prays the two rakats. And then Umar himself, now he begins to clean the Masjid. So you know where the dome of the rock, you've seen the dome of the rock, yeah? Actually, the dome of the rock, many of us believe that the dome of the rock is Masjid Al-Aqsa. No, the entire compound is Masjid Al-Aqsa. That's just a part of it. Now, this place, the dome of the rock was the dirtiest place 
in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Why? Because the Christians believed that this was the place where they had sacrificed Isa alayhi salatu salam. So what they would do is that they made it a rubbish tip to the degree that the narration mentioned that women, after they would finish their periods, they would send their rags to be thrown in the, in the, in, in, in the dome of the rock. So Umar radiallahu anhu now he begins to clean it. So he starts cleaning it. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu see him cleaning it and they begin to assist him. And Umar radiallahu anhu takes all the rubbish from there. Then comes the time for Salah, the first Salah. So he prayed his two rakats, now it's time for Salah. So Umar radiallahu anhu looks around and who does he see? He says Bilal. Bilal radiallahu anhu, he sees Bilal. And he says, oh Bilal, give the adhan. Bilal, give the adhan. And Bilal radiallahu anhu says, is Amir al-Mu'mineen after the demise of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I don't give the adhan anymore. I can't bear to give the adhan. So Umar radiallahu anhu insists. So Bilal stands up, La ilaha illallah. And he says, Allah akbar, Allah akbar. The narration mentioned that those Sahaba who had embraced Islam and their beards were black and now had turned gray out of old age. Every single one of them were drenched with tears. Because it brought back the time of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar radiallahu anhu cried so much. He cried so much that they had to console Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar radiallahu anhu. This is how much Umar radiallahu anhu cried. And look at this honor. Look at this honor Allah gave to Bilal. From being a slave. You become a mu'addin of the Prophet Sallallahu You're the mu'addin in Medina. On Fateh Makkah, on the conquest, when Makkah is conquered, the happiest day in the life of the muhajirun, they're coming home. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bilal, you give the adhan. But not only you give the adhan, Bilal, you climb onto the Kaaba, stand on the Kaaba itself, the most holiest roof, for the Muslims and the Muslims and give the adhan. Then years later comes the conquest of Al-Aqsa. Who give the adhan on the conquest of Aqsa? That once upon a time slave who Allah took out of the slavery of man and placed him under the slavery of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Umar radiallahu now leads the salah. Now imagine this. Umar is leading the salah. So he stands up. He says, straighten the safs. Khalid bin Walid is in the saf. Shrahbil ibn Hasana. Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Abaydat ibn Jarrah. And hundreds of other sahaba radiallahu anhu. Can they be a nicer salah than this? Yes, I'll tell you about another nicer salah than this. When Bilal would give adhan in Medina, and then the Prophet ﷺ would come out of the house of Aisha radiallahu anha, and he would stand on the musalla, on the sajada, and he would turn around, and he would say, straighten your saf. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, the Ashra Mubashara, the people of Badr, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ radiallahu anhum. Can you imagine that salah? Let me tell you about the salah even better than that. Let's go back to Al-Aqsa. When Allah says, Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi, laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-Aqsa. Pure is that being who took his slave, the messenger of Allah, from masjid al-haram to masjid al-Aqsa. Now imagine this salah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns around and he says, straighten your safs. It's not Abu Bakr and Umar. It's Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. It's Yusuf. It's Yunus. It's Musa. It's Yaqub alayhi salatu salam. Can there be any other salah? Never, never has there been a salah recorded which is more mubarak than the salah that the Prophet sallallahu led in Masjid al-Aqsa. 124,000 Anbiya alayhi salatu salam. You go to Masjid al-Aqsa, Literally anywhere 
that you will do sajda and Nabi would have done sajda in that place. If, if there was no other virtue, oh Masjid Aqsa, that would suffice. That you would have the honor of walking in the same place where all the Anbiya alayhim salatu salam, from Adam to Muhammad alayhim salatu salam walked. No other virtue. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam now he finishes his salah. Sorry, Umar radiallahu anhu, he finishes his salah. So imagine this, this, this is a jeep. So Umar now finishes his salah and he turns around and he begins to cry. And they said, Umir al muminin what are you crying for? This is a joyous occasion. This is what an occasion. You have fulfilled the prophecy of the message of Allah. You have taken the masjid created by Sulaiman alayhi salatu salam. And this was the amazing wallahi thing about Umar. Because Umar radiallahu anhu had his finger on the pulse. Umar radiallahu anhu said, I know. You don't need to tell me that. But what concerns me is that the words of the Prophet ﷺ when he climbed on the pulpit and he said, it is not shirk that I fear for you, but is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the dunya for you. And you compete in the dunya like those who competed before you. And the dunya destroys you like it destroyed those before you. Omar knew that the Muslims were the dominant power. And normally when you become dominant, because everything which goes up comes down. This is a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Omar knew that the Muslims were the dominant power. And this is what concerned Umar radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, I know this. But what concerns me is that the dunya, Allah has opened the dunya, it's enfolded in front of you. But it will destroy us like it destroyed those who came before us. And then Umar radiallahu anhu finished his salah. And then the patriarch wanted to take Umar around Jerusalem. So right next to Masjid Al-Aqsa is the main church of Christendom where they believe that Isa salam, is buried. So he's taking Umar around and it's Salah time. So Salah time comes. So he says, Amir al muminin don't worry, you can pray Salah in the church. So Umar said, no. Look at the, look at the hikm of Umar. He said, no. He said, because if I pray Salah here, later Muslims will say that our Amir al muminin prayed Salah here, therefore this belongs to us. So Umar radiallahu left the church and he prayed outside. And today where Umar prayed, you have the Masjid of Umar is still there. And this is amazing. See the Sunnah of Umar? Come many centuries later. The time of Salahuddin. You had the Crusades, the longest battle in history. Two, it, it lasted over 200 years. So they said to Salahuddin, they said, Oh Salahuddin, look, this is not going to finish. We know a way of finishing this. All you have to do is destroy this church because the Christians believe that Isa is buried here. You destroy the church, it's finished. We don't have an issue anymore. The Christian will stop coming here and it's not our Aqidah. Our Aqidah is that Jesus is taken to the heavens. Alayhi salatu salam. What did Salahuddin say? He said, I can't do that. They said, why not? He said, because a man greater than me took Jerusalem and he didn't do it, so I can't do it. Speak about Umar. This was the wisdom of Umar radiallahu anhu. I'm not praying here because subsequent generation will say, you know, the, the slightly milly ones, the slightly hardcore ones will say, no, Umar, Amir al-Mu'mineen prayed here. This belongs to us. And then Umar radiallahu anhu stays a few days in Jerusalem and he leaves. And before Umar radiallahu anhu leaves, he says the amazing thing, wallahi. He says, oh Muslims, let me advise you. He said, let me advise you. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fulfilled his promise to you. Meaning that he said that he would give you Jerusalem, he gave you Jerusalem. And he has made you inheritors in the earth. So remain in the state of shukr. For as long as you remain in the state of shukr, Allah will grant you his favors. And he said, never be ungrateful. And listen to the words. He said, never be ungrateful. For when a person begins to sin, 
he begins to become ungrateful to Allah. And if he does not do tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah removes the honor Allah gave him and Allah places upon his shoulders his enemies. La ilaha illallah. That's it. Three or four sentences, that's all he said. That Allah has fulfilled his promise, remain in the state of shukr. And if you start sinning, then you're no longer in the state of shukr. And if that happens, you don't do tawbah, then Allah will take your honor away from you and he will place upon you your enemies and your enemies will disgrace you. Nowhere, wallahi, I say nowhere in the world is there a greater disgrace for the two billion Muslims than Jerusalem. Nowhere in the world, surrounded by Muslims, a place bigger as Wales. And look how Allah has removed the honor. And it's a collective shame. It's not a shame for the Palestinians, actually for the Palestinians far less than anybody else, because they're holding the fort. It's a bigger shame for everybody else from the Muslim Ummah. This is the conquest of Al-Aqsa by Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. I think I covered about three parts in this. We make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate the status of Amir al-Mu'mineen on our behalf. We make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us an iota of the fikr and the concern that Amir al-Mu'mineen had. We make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya and he reunite us in Jannah. For those barakallahu feekum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.